more to uh, to talk to you know our team here. Uh, we have colleagues from six countries, uh, and uh, we all needless to say really honoured and excited to have you with us. Uh, I must say I feel a little bit awkward addressing you, okay, as yeah. Audrey, yeah. because you are Taiwan's digital minister. But I do know that you prefer people to call you Audrey. Yeah, I have to call you Audrey. 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 Yeah, we, we don't do this uh, the right honourable or, or whatever. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Or, or Minister Tang. Yeah. Yeah, uh, just, just Audrey is fine. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So thank you, Audrey. Uh, and um, I have um, shared some of the of your bio with our colleagues. And uh, everyone was just fascinated, you know, with with your, you know, your your childhood, how you grow up, how you're a child protege, and how you've continued. And now, you know, the Japanese have termed you IT's uh, genius minister. Um, the role you played, I think, you know, in sort of like putting Taiwan ahead of the curve uh, when uh, COVID first broke out, uh, and most of all, um, how you've been such a big champion of social innovation. Uh, and I think in the last four years, uh, you have done nothing but being such a huge champion and supporter of social entrepreneurship and social innovation in Taiwan. Uh, and I think my colleagues and I um, cannot thank you enough. I think you've graced uh, every SE summit. Uh, you've come from the SE year end parties. You've come for DBS 50th anniversary gala dinner. So, you know, uh, really, really, we are just so privileged. Um, we thought that you know in this one hour we would sort of maybe uh, the, for you to perhaps share your views on why social innovation is so important and and how you coined this term social innovation versus social entrepreneurship and how you see it playing such a key role in society today and then i'd like to also spend about half an hour opening up to questions i've got some questions lined up already for you also so if that's oh, really? okay with you, Audrey. Can, um, can I yeah. see those questions? Uh, are they available somewhere? I mean, I can just, you know, dive right into the questions. I um, also find that <laughs> more interactive. Um, uh, I, I do have the questions with me. Um, uh, uh -huh. I, 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 I think I can arrange for them to be sent to you or something because I don't know how yeah. to post those questions. Yeah. Sure, 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 sure. Yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, I'm just pasting my uh, personal email uh, to the uh, chat uh, okay. and feel free just to to send a copy uh, to my personal email uh, okay. and uh, and it's me uh, personally who read them all. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, and, you you and don't also, have a Audrey bot somewhere. <laughs> that's right. That's right. That's right. Uh, and and also I think I'll just begin with uh, really my uh, gratitude and appreciation uh, because before I got into this job uh, five years ago as digital minister in charge of social innovation, already the idea of social entrepreneurship is only uh, you know visible in time because of two very important organizations one being dps uh, and in addition to dps the the udm vision project uh, these two uh, one in the banking sector and one in the media sector uh, collaboratively defined social entrepreneurship uh, for most of the social enterprises in taiwan previously uh, we have co-ops we have uh, many like credit unions and so on many uh, local community building projects and so on but they don't collectively refer to themselves as social entrepreneurs. Uh, and by uh, settling on the social entrepreneurship as a shared label, uh, co-set by, of course, SE Insights and so on, but mostly by UDM Vision and DBS, uh, we uh, share the common best or better practices across all the different sectors and really builds this new idea called the social sector. Previously, in many other jurisdictions, it is known only as the nonprofits uh, or the charities uh, or the voluntary sector uh, or um, the third sector or whatever. But uh, what, what we are seeing in Taiwan is that the social sector or Shehui Bumen often takes the lead when there is a new situation, emerging situation in Taiwan. For example, our counter pandemic effort or the digital innovations are driven by the social sector, um, the um, mask rationing map, the SMS-based contact tracing QR check-in uh, system, many, many systems, they were not government technologies, they were not private sector technologies.
technologies. These are social technologies invented by civic technologists in the social sector. And this is what enabled us to counter the pandemic with no lockdown and also counter the infodemic, the disinformation crisis with no takedown. Because if we concentrate the power to either a few large corporations or a few uh, large ministries, then we uh, basically decimate, like reduce by 10%. Every time we introduce such a top-down um, endeavor, we will make the social innovators job harder to do because everyone just, you know, obey what the government say that people should do without understanding or without remixing uh, it into new potentials. But because of this emphasis on social entrepreneurship, people who are uh, willing to contribute to counter pandemic or counter infodemic uh, efforts understand that they can work with these people in the same social sector to gain the legitimacy to build a new norm on ways to check in uh, on venues, on ways to, um, you know, uh, find the nearby pharmacy that still have masks and so on, uh, or remake some cute dog memes uh, to convince people to wear a mask or whatever. Uh, and so they can actually empower the people in the uh, front line, in the field. And then our job in the uh, executive UN or the cabinet office is just to amplify those new practices that emerges out of the social entrepreneurship scene and convince the other private sectors to join and support these new norm. And so this is what I call people public private partnership. It's not we procuring service and products from the vendors. It's the other way around. It's the social entrepreneurs procuring, reverse procuring um, stable APIs, reverse procuring um, the visibility of their products and services and so on that we can provide in the public sector. So this is like my five minutes pitch. I would like really to uh, engage the, the Q&A to uh, delve deeper uh, into the specifics uh, of this social entrepreneurship and innovation um, ideas. Right. Audrey, so, so perhaps maybe I could ask you, so in your mind, when you define social innovation, because I think it's a term that you, you uh -huh. kind of, yeah, yes. so what, what is it to you? And there's a lot of talk about ESG these days, you know, about mm -hmm. sustainable yes. development and ESG. Mm -hmm. So is, do you see so the social sector as the S in ESG or mm -hmm. what, what is it to yeah. you? And how do you see it in, in, in that, that, that context? That's right. Uh, to me, social innovation uh, means everyone's business with everyone's help uh, or in Mandarin 众人之事众人助之. so the first part everyone's business means that it is serving a common purpose with everyone's help means that it's a model of open innovation everyone not the people who are already uh, in the supply chain or uh, who are your shareholders or customers like literally everyone uh, who are affected uh, by this common issue may uh, contribute through open innovation uh, into something that other people may pick up uh, and remix and make it even better so the common purpose and the open innovation are the two uh, kind of pillars of social innovation and digital social innovation of course amplifies this so that even people who are on different time zones uh, may join social innovations together. Uh, previously, social innovation in Taiwan mostly referred to community building, like people who are physically neighbors. Uh, but in the digital era, of course, people who care about the same thing are naturally neighbors. Uh, and so in a sense, the SDGs are 17 neighborhood uh, and the uh, 169 smaller districts uh, within it, that's the concrete targets within the SDGs. So anyone who choose to um, index their work, their impact using the SDG vocabulary is basically declaring their household registration in one of their 17 virtual neighborhoods for them to co-discover and to uh, join uh, the partners. Uh, previously, they may not know because one is in social sector, another one is in the private sector, some people are in the public service and so on. But because we all index our work in SDG terms and even the educational facilities like universities in Taiwan also index their university social responsibility or USR courses using the SDG 169 specific target as a common index. So on our social innovation platform, if you know which SDG target you're working toward, you have a set of natural allies who are your neighbors, which can, of course, then uh, innovate together with you. So everyone's business with everyone's help, but this everyone is natural neighborhoods formed toward the common index SDG goals. 
And and you know you you, you talk about uh, the infodemic and digital innovation and all that. So the world is just changing so fast, you know. Uh, so uh, you you feel that the social sector, everyone's business, everyone's help. That how do you ensure that they stay ahead and 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 not lag behind? You know, mm -hmm. I mean, because mm -hmm. the pace of change is so daunting. Or do you think that's a concern at all? You know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the pace of change is so daunting, which is why we rely on the collective intelligence in the social sector to tell us where the world is heading, right? Um, in, in Taiwan in 2019, December, uh, on this forum called the PTT, uh, there is a post from Dr. Uh, Li Wenliang's message that, uh, and I quote, seven new SARS cases are discovered uh, in the Huanan seafood market, end of quote. Now, in many other jurisdictions, in many other social media forums, the same message may have uh, been shared uh, there, but only in Taiwan on PTD after 24 hours of people just uh, pouring in their expertise to triage that message, so to speak. After 24 hours, we realized this is probably legit. And on the first day of 2020, we start the health inspection for all qualified passengers coming in from Wuhan to Taiwan. And the reason why is that the PTT is in the social sector. Um, it, unlike Reddit or Facebook or other social media, it has no shareholders and no advertisers. It's just a student pet project from National Taiwan University that's been running in an open source manner for like 25 years or something. So this shows the importance of collective intelligence because only on those more pro-social social media systems can we truly get this like advanced radar uh, from something uh, that's coming in to the people with expertise and uh, shared interests who can triage it and uh, just amplify the signal, not the noise. So do you feel with that uh, sort of uh, philosophy that uh, it would also weed out any negative news or fake fake information and things like that? Is that how they would, um, you know, because yes. there's positive, yes. positive and negative, right? I mean, so uh, how, how do you kind of weed out how technology could also kind of be more disruptive in a bad way uh, mm -hmm. than in a good way? Do you feel that the social mm -hmm. sector would somehow mm -hmm. mediate it and kind of like call out the fakes? Mm -hmm. I mean, is that what it is? Yeah. Yes, it, it, that's exactly the case. In the physical space, we have this idea of civic spaces or public infrastructure, like a town hall, a public library, a museum, uh, a national park, uh, whatever, right? Uh, and we, when we hold public deliberations or hearings in a town hall, uh, in the building itself, in the interaction patterns, there's certain patterns that encourage pro-social behavior. Now, on the digital space, we're seeing exactly the same emerging in the more pro-social spaces such as the PTT or our national petition platform, the joint platform, and so on. And if we classify these as important infrastructure, even though it's made of bits, not of concrete, uh, then we can uh, subsidize or invest uh, sufficient funding for those public infrastructure to serve uh, the purpose of town halls and so on. But if a government and the social sector do not invest in these pro-social digital public infrastructures, then people who want to deliberate, to talk about about something that people would talk about in a town hall will be forced to do so uh, on, say, Facebook. And that would be like holding a town hall meeting uh, on the local district's nightclub uh, with very loud music, uh, smoke filled room. You have to shout to get her private bouncers, addictive drinks, and so on. Uh, and, and with all due respect, I mean, the night, night clubs and so on serve an important social function. It's just a social function, it's not democratic deliberation. Right, right, yeah. Okay, so Audrey, so we've emailed you the questions. Yes, so you I've can, got the questions here. Yeah. yeah. So um, I, you know, can read some out to you or, or would you like to kind of go through it and, and, uh, and pick and choose and leave it to, up to you? Yeah. yeah, sure, sure, sure. Yeah. So uh, I'll just paste uh, each question to the chat without reading it aloud. Uh, yeah. I believe everyone can read the chat. Okay. Yeah. So um, yeah, for the first question, uh, I'm most proud of the fact that I still get eight hours of sleep every night, <laughs> even, even working as the digital minister. And, uh, and I heard, I read that you clear your inbox and you've got nothing left over every day. So how do you do that and still sleep eight hours a day? Yeah. 
I know, right? So I, I do that through this idea called the Pomodoro method. So I work in a very focused manner for 25 minutes and then take five minutes break. And during those 25 minutes of focus, nothing interrupts me. So uh, by sending me, um, you know, instant message or whatever, I, I don't read it. There's no vibration or notification until half an hour later. So all my colleagues understand that it's not that I don't read their messages, it's that I only read it every half an hour. And so because of this, I get to batch process because if you read your messages all the time, then you're basically caught uh, into this um, kind of distraction filled mood uh, where you have to wait for this person to complete their thought, that person to complete their thought and so on. But when I check that every half an um, hour, then it's like emails, right? Everybody have already completed their preliminary discussion and thought and so on. I only have to say, oh, this makes sense or this looks uh, good to me or that person you have to consult them and so i can make such decisions very quickly like 30 seconds and so on but if i uh, check my inbox uh, like every five minutes i wouldn't be able to work at all so the pomodoro method is a pretty good method i've been practicing that for more than 10 years now i see i see okay all and right. uh, what keeps you awake at night that continuing on that question and if i could add on to that um, sure related to that so what do you see as your biggest challenges you know in the next you know let's say 12 to 18 months yeah yeah i'm always asleep at night nothing keeps me awake at night. <laughs> Uh, uh, recently, I think the only thing that awakens me at night was a pretty large earthquake. But other than that, other than like physical earthquakes, uh, I, I think I, I sleep pretty, pretty well. Uh, but it doesn't mean that I don't take my job seriously. Uh, it's just that um, I do my work uh, when I sleep. Um, mostly uh, when I'm awake, I listen to all the various different stakeholders, positions, ideas, and so on without passing judgments. So I don't say this is good, this is bad, or whatever. Uh, I'll say, I always say, I'll sleep on it. Uh, and then I go to sleep. And after eight hours, I often and almost always wake up with a more synthetic idea, a more synthetic innovation that take care of the kind of good enough consensus and that everyone can live with. So I do my uh, work uh, at night. Uh, when I'm asleep, I don't know how I do this work, but I usually wake up with pretty good ideas. And when I, uh, I'm forced to, you know, um, uh, handle like stakeholders that are very much in tension with each other or like more than five or six different stakeholder groups and so on, I work longer. I put in more hours. I sleep for nine hours or even 10 hours. Uh, and then I wake up with a pretty good solution. Okay, I see. Dang, I got it all wrong. Okay, I think my yeah, I need to sleep more than yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, so the the next one is um uh in the list in your view, what are the most effective ways for corporates, you know, to partner with governments, you know, to help drive um you know social innovation and support the community? Mm -hmm. Well, just check out what the DBS is doing. Uh, and <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. But, but quite seriously, I, I, I do think that uh, in promoting social entrepreneurship, uh, DBS chose a, a way that involves the, the people uh, within DBS. So it's not just one single department, the CSR department or the BD department, the HR department and so on. It's literally all the departments who are engaging with the social entrepreneurship in a way that truly builds partnerships. And I do believe that when the government see that the social entrepreneurs are tackling the same issues that the government is tackling and also in a way that's provably more effective in some of the emerging trends and so on. And DBS also helps by proving that it's actually more effective than governments by calculating the SROI, SRS and things like that, right? So when the social entrepreneurship provably does the government's jobs better, it makes a democratic government really happy because we can put our tax dollars elsewhere and then rely <laughs> on the social entrepreneurs uh, to tackle of these emerging issues. So basically the social entrepreneurs supported by DBS and the entire social entrepreneurship ecosystem is like research and the public exploration is like development. So whenever we see something that is emerging, uh, 
in between our budget cycle because really we can only allocate our national budgets uh, once every year. So between two years when some emerging situation comes and the social entrepreneurship is getting really good tackling it, then we just say, you know, we, we can't beat them, we must join them. <laughs> and then we just adapt whatever norm that the social entrepreneurship uh, have already set and adopt it as national policy. So when people figure out, for example, how to uh, replace the plastic straws, our national identity drink, the bubble tea, uh, into uh, circular economy upcycle norms and so on, uh, it's really easy for our environmental protection agents to simply point to those uh, social entrepreneurship and say, just do whatever they're doing. Okay, that's going to be our national standard uh, one year down the line or things like that. So moving on to the next question, sustainable development is a priority in today's world. You mm -hmm. know? Uh, do you have any specific focus areas that you are extra passionate about? Yeah. Sure, sure. Yeah, as the digital minister, uh, my focus is on SDG 17, uh, and that is a uh, partnership for the goals, because I believe that in the digital realm, what we are doing is to make sure that what previously uh, are may seem as zero sum games, like uh, the environmental value against economic development, social justice versus new innovations or things like that. On the digital realm, we can always think of ways to leverage the network effect, the uh, uh, almost zero marginal cost of innovation and so on, and just brainstorm out of ways uh, that seem zero sum into ways that are positive sum. And to do that more specifically, I mean, uh, target 17, 18, to get everyone to publish reliable data, um, target 17, 17, to encourage effective partnerships across sectors based on those data, we call it data coalition. Uh, and then 17, 6, open innovation to share those technology innovations uh, to uh, collaborate with uh, developing uh, economies and other jurisdictions and so on. So every year we run a presidential hackathon from the spirit of SDG 17. And this year, for example, we're focusing on climate action for our international track. Yeah, speaking of uh, climate action, uh, I think you do know that uh, at DBS we support, um, amongst other things, uh, a, a big movement to kind of reduce food waste because we believe that food waste actually contributes to, or rather not we believe, but we know that food waste contributes about eight to 10% of global greenhouse gas emissions. And mm -hmm. so uh, it's something that, you know, we all need to eat to live. And so everyone can play their part in reducing, you know, this GHGs and, uh, and hopefully to slow down climate change a bit. Yeah. So yeah, uh, definitely. I, I think um, upcycling uh, is really, really exciting to me because uh, it shows an economic incentive, right, for consumers to engage in higher valued upcycle products. Like this, this jacket is made out of upcycle jeans, <laughs> and so uh, and if we can do it to to jackets, certainly we can do it with uh, agricultural products like making good jams or whatever uh, drinks and so on out of the uh, previously upcycled material. Thank you. So, okay, let's maybe move on because we've got uh, quite a few questions here. Sure. This one, uh, you, you play and continue to play a key role in leveraging tech and innovation to deal with COVID-19 in Taiwan. Uh -huh. um, what were some of the challenges and how did you overcome them? Yeah. Uh -huh, sure. Um, I, I think during the pandemic, one of the most challenging things that we faced this May on our truly the first wave right in Taiwan uh, is that it was really cumbersome to to check in uh, to venues because uh, a lot of people uh, who have smartphones do not actually have the expertise to install new apps. There's at least 20% of people who can use whatever built-in app there is on their smartphone, but cannot install new apps. So if you introduce new apps for checking into venues or to uh, navigate to Google Forms or things like that, chances are that they will not want to uh, do that and they will resort to pen and paper, which carries its own transmission uh, issues, well, virus transmission issues and also information transmission issues. So uh, what we it is not uh, to dictate anything. We just look at uh, the GovZero G0V community, which is uh, Taiwan's leading civic technologies hub. Uh, and we see already that people there are brainstorming on ways to use just the building app in a smartphone to complete check-ins through SMS. Because if you have an iPhone, you know what I'm talking about, you don't have to unlock anything, right? You just swipe, which gets into the camera. You point it to a QR code and it shows the SMS and you just click send 
and then within like two seconds you complete the check-in and you, you can just walk in and so uh, without unlocking your phone this made the kind of initial friction of adopting new habits much easier right so um, I think the key here using digital technology is not that we're asking people to work with our technology is the government working with the people working with the technologies that already invented something new and we just made it very easy to to get such QR codes and so on uh, so in other jurisdictions uh, usually it takes months to uh, innovate and to get the procurement contract right to roll out something like that of course if you're in an efficient jurisdiction like Singapore that may be shortened to one week or something uh, through the GovTech uh, unit uh, but in Taiwan because it's like a swarm hundreds of people trying out different prototypes and all we did is just to pick the prototype that makes the most sense so our uh, innovation the SMS 1922 SMS system took just 72 hours uh, before millions of people uh, adopted it so it's like really fast and, and fair and also fun so it was overcome through collective intelligence again through social innovation and the next part of this question is what do you think the next frontier is for social innovation you know is mm -hmm. Sure. Uh, I, I believe that the SDG uh, push that made the entire investment ecosystem really care about ESGs is really the, the upcoming frontier. Uh, five years ago, when I took up this job, um, people were, were saying that the social entrepreneurs, uh, you know, have the, the worst of both worlds because they have to make a profit and they also have to explain their purpose. And not many people would understand uh, their purpose. Um, and because the business as usual, the business which does nothing, uh, will do, do not suffer social sanction, do not suffer any disadvantage, right? So even if they continue to, to burn energy in a, you know, non uh, contributive way to uh, fighting climate change and so on, they will have no problem at all getting investment and loans and things like that, which puts the social entrepreneurs that really care about climate action uh, at a comparative uh, disadvantage. But five years later, we're, we're now seeing this to uh, to change um, happening. I, I think in DBS, you're you're beginning to roll out this new strategy of stopping to giving loans to uh, to the companies that contribute a lot to uh, burning, you know, carbon dioxide and other uh, greenhouse gases and so on. So uh, in Taiwan, we're seeing that our public listed companies are, are already doing that voluntarily, but soon they will be also doing that in a mandatory fashion because of our, our new, um, you know, green financing policies. So the social innovators, far from, you know, carrying an extra burden, suddenly become the, the best coaches to coach this freshly uh, forced into ESG uh, larger enterprises to guide them into proving their social value and using their investment in a truly pro-environment and pro-social way, because otherwise they might face social sanctions. So really this frontier of uh, if you're not part of solution, you're part of the problem uh, in the investment scene, uh, I really think is a tremendous opportunity for social entrepreneurs. Right. Audrey, if I could ask you uh, this, uh, a question related to that. So there's much talk about ESG. Yes. Uh, and, and I think the E, because it's the environment, it's about green and all that. I think a lot of people, it's, it's more easily understood. Mm -hmm. um, uh, S is less clear and mm -hmm. probably more misunderstood. Uh, do, do you agree with that? And how could we help people to understand the true value of the S in ESG? Sure. Uh, so the, the S, I always read it as uh, stakeholders, right? <laughs> like how, how well you're communicating with the stakeholders. This is like my other portfolio, the open government uh, portfolio, because the government, of course, always work for the people. But nowadays, um, most of the problem cannot be solved by government alone. So instead of just saying, okay, we're working for the people, we must say now we're working with the people. But how do we know what the people truly want, right? If we, we use posts, surveys, and so on, they're limited by our initial definition of the problem. But we don't want to be limited by that, which is why we engage the uh, 
um, I, I want to say uh, citizens, but also residents, really, and people too young to vote, like pretty much everyone who have something to say about our governing direction and so on, like if they feel strongly about our counter epidemic efforts, they can just pick up the phone, call this to toll free number 1922 and, and speak to a really empathetic uh, listener about how they want the counter epidemic uh, effort to, to change. Uh, and sometimes it results in like a policy change within 24 hours, like uh, last April, a young boy called 1922 saying, uh, you're rationing our mask. All I get is pink mask. All the boys on my class have blue ones, and I don't want to wear pink to school. Do something about it. And then the very next day on 2 p.m. press conference, all the medical offices, including the minister, wore, wore pink uh, masks. Uh, and the minister, Chen, our uh, commander for Central Epidemic Command Center, even said that Pink Panther was his childhood hero. So suddenly the boy became the most hit boy in the class for only he has the color that the heroes where and a hero's heroes where I guess so anyway so so the point here is not a top-down gender mainstreaming or anti-bullying or, or whatever this is about just taking in new stakeholders information and turning it into really a meme right something something new that people would like to share idea was spreading and things like that and so that is of course stakeholder engagement people would get much more encouraged to continue to call 1822 just last year more than 2 million phone calls to contribute to our Counter epidemic um, efforts. So that's the S, the, the society, right? If the entire society, all the stakeholders understand it's in everyone's interest to contribute to your mission, then your company, your ESG strategy can leverage the uh, collective intelligence of your entire, not just customer, but also supplier, like basically anyone who care about the same thing that you care about. Right, thanks. Okay, let's move to the next one. Mm-hmm. The pace of tech advancement is progressing at exponential speed. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, businesses, banking, all being disrupted. Mm -hmm. uh, how do you and your team stay on top of the changes? And when you roll out digital innovations, do you ever fear mm -hmm. they may fail? And how mm -hmm. do you overcome those fears? Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, not every technology is uh, exponential. Uh, I often refer to battery technology, which is definitely not exponential. Uh, it, what looks initially exponential may be sigmoid, right? <laughs> so <laughs> so uh, what, what I'm trying to say is that um, exponential speed only uh, appears if each incremental change also feedback into the velocity of the change. But sometimes the technology advancement doesn't quite work uh, in that way. Sometimes people think this is good enough and then just move on their energy on something else. And so uh, what I'm trying to say is that instead of, you know, part of the hype cycle is buying into every emerging technology, uh, instead of uh, buying into those emerging technologies, I, I sometimes say, no, let's just bring technology to the people. Let the people who actually need those technology dictate uh, what kind of technology are worth investing. And so instead of saying, you know, we're uh, staying on top of things, we're staying on the bottom of things, right? Where we want to understand deeply at the bottom why people use this technology and why those people don't. When we uh, roll out, for example, new AI strategies, we emphasize that each and every like middle schooler using those AI models and so on are um, given a education curriculum that focus not on literacy, which is comprehension, but on competence, which is co-production co-creation so they can take those AI models change a few lines to uh, assist themselves in a, in a better way they can install new say air boxes that contribute to climate science by measuring things uh, as part of that also learning about data stewardship and data bias when they learn about journalism it's not just about reading news but about fact checking the presidential debates and forums and so on in real time working with uh, the uh, mainstream media and things like that and these these are all technologies, but these are socially um, developed technologies. Uh, democracy itself, our voting system and so on, is also one such social technology that we're always thinking about how to improve the, the bit rate of democracy, not just three bits per four years, which is called voting, <laughs> but uh, all, all sort of day-to-day -day ways to improve such technologies. So uh, instead of staying on top of the change or leading the change, what we want to do is to understand the real societal needs and then work with the innovators in the field to empower the people closest to 
the pain to remix whatever service we provide, like Lego blocks uh, that they can piece together using the open APIs. And in this way, uh, there is no fear of failure because all we are providing is like a toolkit. Uh, one uh, slogan that I often use uh, is in Mandarin, 开门造局你行你来, which translated is something like you and we're building behind open doors, uh, right? If you can contribute, uh, then it's your turn, right? So, so go ahead and do it. So for all people who say, okay, the ministers, um, you know, digital service sucks. And we're like, hey, here's a invitation to our collaborative meeting. Uh, show us what you can do better, building upon the API that we're already doing. So just by inviting all the complaints into co-creation tickets, there's no failure because failure is just a invitation for more contributions. So that's why you have your regular Wednesday meetings where you go out and conduct all these workshops too. Yeah, I that's that's exactly right. Today. That's exactly right. And if you complain on Twitter or social media and mention my name, and if I think your ideas are better, I immediately thank you and say uh, you're amplified, meaning that we're uh, adopting your ideas next week or something. Right. Okay. Thanks, Audrey. So let's move on. Um, AI is a polarizing subject. Mm -hmm. Elon Musk and Jack Ma are known, uh, you know, are notable for having high profile debate on whether it's either helpful or harmful to humankind. Mm -hmm. What are your views on it? you know, and, and, you know, on its ability to be harnessed for good. And again, are there potential dangers here? Sure. Uh, for me, AI stands for assistive intelligence meaning that it's assisting me, not replacing me. It's like my, my eyeglasses, which help me to see you better, but it doesn't replace uh, me, right? And it should not say show those pop-up advertisement, uh, and I have to wait for 10 seconds before closing it, <laughs> because then otherwise it would, it would not be working in my best interest. It would be working in the advertiser's best interest. So that's the alignment. And if my eyeglass is broken, I can take it and fix it myself or in a nearby repair shop and so on without paying $1 million license fee uh, to the manufacturer. Uh, so it's also accountable. And if something is both aligned and accountable to me, then to me, it's assistive. Otherwise, it's taking agency away from me, and I call it authoritarian. So AI may be authoritarian intelligence, which is like uh, really harmful to democracies, uh, but really helpful to authoritarian regimes. Or it may be assistive intelligence, uh, which is really liberating for democracies democracies, but may pose a threat to authoritarian regimes. So it all depends on which configuration of society you want. It could be either assistive, empowering the individuals and the interpersonal relationships, or it may be authoritarian, make the decisions for you. Interesting. So now we have all of a new definition of AI, assistive right. intelligence. Yeah, thank you. That's very interesting. Next question. Um, this is a bit of a long question, so I'll read it out. The, the internet is responsible for one, roughly 1 billion tons of greenhouse gases a year. Sustainable web is an approach to designing web services with the goal of reducing carbon emissions and energy consumption. What are your thoughts that this is a must do, especially for businesses with sizable digital presence? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I do believe that as a way to raise the awareness this is very important, right? Uh, by saying that it needs to be clean, efficient, open, honest, regenerative, and resilient, uh, we promote a, a whole new thinking, like uh, me wearing this jacket is also promoting this sort of thinking, right? To, to think about upcycling all the time. So I think it's very inspiring. Uh, on the other hand, of course, I, I do believe that the web, uh, even though it burns some energy, it also designs, uh, helps to design systems that without a web would be unable to do a lot of open innovation happens on the web and that include the cutting edge um you know green uh, energy projects the science projects uh, that uh, without which there's no no hope to tackle the climate action together so uh, i think we also need in addition to pay at pay paying attention on how we build those technologies also on how those technology may be may be used right the future is already here it's just not evenly distributed right as many people like to say uh, for example um when um Bitcoin, um, 
did not have any competitor when Bitcoin was the only of its kind. Not many people talk about the greenhouse gas emissions of the Bitcoin mining. But when, for example, Ethereum declared that it want to undergo sustainable transformation to Ethereum 2.0, which would only use one fraction of the you know energy that Ethereum 1.0 used to use, uh, then it puts a tremendous pressure on people who endorse Bitcoin because then they have to justify why they are still using a uh, greenhouse gas emitting um, distributed ledger technology. So uh, by serving as uh, examples as early movers by uh, taking energy innovations from one sector or one project and moving into another project, I think we can also contribute positively, not just uh, to maintain our own project to make it clean, open, efficient and open, but also share it as best practice or at least better practice for other projects. Yeah, no, I, I agree with that. I mean, I think we need to kind of take a step back and look at the totality of it versus the individual portions. Yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. Yep. So moving on, uh, on the same topic of the web, if you can travel back in time and change one or two things about the internet, you know, for the better good, what would they be and why? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, I, I do think that on the beginnings of the World Wide Web, which is designed to be co-editable, like every individual visitor is invited to co-create, to edit a web page uh, on a version controlled system, a little bit like what Google Docs is doing now, but it's actually part of the original design uh, on the next step uh, machine, if I understand correctly by Tim Berners-Lee. But when Internet Explorer uh, popularized the web, it did not um, include the, the composer part, right? It's just the reading part uh, and multimedia part and so on. So uh, then the early internet became a little bit like TV. And then when people perceive it as a TV, then it becomes quite natural to think about the funding mechanism as funding TV channels, which is advertisement. And then that's introduced into the web standards, cookies and other technologies that makes the advertiser's job easier, but makes individual's job harder uh, to, to maintain this co-creative relationship. So if I can change one thing, I'll just go back in time uh, and include Google Doc-like capability into the original versions of web browsers from day one, so that people understand the web's value is not just in advertisement, but in the co-production, the social production of value you as people are rediscovering now yeah again the power of the collective I, I, I noticed that seems to be a very powerful concept in your mind that you know you actually do practice in a, a big way in Taiwan mm -hmm. and the power of the collective yeah that's that's exactly right yeah okay so the next question um I mean you know I, I mean I had the privilege of meeting you a few times Audrey and I, I knew about your background uh, but then when I read again in preparation for this meeting and all that, I was just completely wowed by, you know, your, your illustrious career. So this question is uh, from one of my colleagues. Um, you know, so far, be it professional or personal, you've done so much amazing things. Do you have any regrets, you know, today? And yeah. Yeah, yeah uh, I do have a regret. Last year, we, we focused on the use of face masks, of properly wearing it and washing it and so on. And we were quite proud that using the rationing system, we get three quarters of people wearing masks at all times and so on. And then the virus mutated and it become airborne. <laughs> and the mask doesn't matter as much as uh, good ventilation. <laughs> but uh, but uh, by over-focusing on our early successes, when I got my, my job, uh, AstraZeneca in April, I had a very hard time convincing my friends and family to get vaccinated uh, because they, they, they thought, uh, and rightly, uh, in last year's context that they wear the mask and wash their hands and keep good social distance and things like that and then of course by may we have our first wave and we were poorly vaccinated as a country uh back then and of course now we're you know over um 10 million doses uh and we do have a pretty good supply of vaccines now and the willingness seems pretty good uh, it's likely we will meet 70 or even 80 percent by the end of the year but we we did lo lose like two months worth of opportunity if we um, just panic a little bit more, right, <laughs> by, by April. So that's one of my bigger regrets. Right, right. And now Taiwan is manufacturing your own vaccine as well. I saw your president. Yeah, the, the Medigen, yes. Yes, Medigen, that's right, yeah, yeah. Okay, so moving on, this is one question, but actually it's got four questions built into it. Um, has technology made us less human? Is it foolish to be wary of technological progress? Does technology always make life better? 
and are we overly dependent on digital technology? So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, no, maybe, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> let me let me try again. Okay, okay. okay. right. Okay, maybe so, one, yeah. has technology made us less human? Yeah. Yeah, I I, I think uh, like writing is a technology. Uh, from the early uh, ancient Greek days, people have already argued quite persuasively that writing makes us less human because uh, we rely less on the uh, complete context of our interpersonal relationships uh, to tell our stories. We put more, more faith on something that's written, but it does not actually have the nuances uh, of the actual social configuration and so on. Uh, so people become more alienated to each other and so on you can find in early Greek uh, philosophical writings. So my, my point is that that's, that's how technology works. Uh, the society reconfigure ourselves around technology and to me, the main question is that are we leaving people behind? Are there people who are affected that do not have a say on where the society is heading vis-a-vis -vis new technological developments? If a technology is shared in the entire society in equity, uh, like writing eventually did, then it's it's pro-social, it's helpful. But if a technology do not disperse equally and when uh, as time goes on actually concentrates power uh, to few people um, and take whatever little power that uh, ordinary citizens had away from them, then that's anti-social technology. So uh, technology always made us different, always changed the human condition. But I care about democratization of technology and I use that word in its original sense, like making the society more democratic, not just it's you know cheaper and more accessible. Okay, understand, yeah. Uh, again, back to the power of the people and the collective, right? No yes. One no one's left behind. Uh, so the second part of this, uh, I guess you've kind of answered it. Is it foolish to be wary of technological progress? No, no, it's not. Yeah, yeah right. <laughs> yeah. Uh, does technology always make life better? I guess if you do it Maybe. in the right way. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And last but not least, are we overly dependent, you know, on digital technology? Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, I think that here uh, I want to elaborate a little bit more. Maybe, maybe we are, uh, but it's not um, the technologies uh, enslaving people or limiting people, restricting people, harming people. It's always people harming other people through technology. So I want to get this relationship <laughs> right. <laughs> right. So, so it's not a, a abstract tech somewhere that's good or bad. It's uh, some people who want to use tech to empower others or some people who want to use tech to take um, rights and agencies away from others. So by uh, talking just about tech, uh, it's like putting uh, too much um, attention and energy uh, on the tools, on the instruments. But I think our discussion should always be, uh, where is the, the, what's the power relationship? When you introduce technology, is it aligned with the people who are affected? Uh, are they accountable who, to the people who are affected by it. If we keep asking these two questions and get good enough shared values and then innovate based on those shared values, then we wouldn't go anywhere wrong. But if we don't do this, then then maybe, maybe we will hurt part of the society. Right, right. And I guess that sort of nicely leads into the next question, because you mm -hmm. said it's not about technology, it's about how people are using technology to harm mm -hmm. other people. Yep. So similarly in this question here, what are your thoughts around how much misinformation and disinformation there is on social media and how can we actually put technology for good in this, you know, use technology for good to kind of perhaps maybe weed things out or kind of better govern or police things? Is that at all possible? Mm -hmm. Yeah, of course. So in Taiwan, we counter the infodemic uh, through the power of cute dogs and memes, uh, some cute cats as well. So uh, when when people see something that is obviously a rumor or something, instead of you know fighting against it, we have dedicated people in each and every ministry. We call them participation officers uh, or POs, and those around a hundred people and so on uh, engage with professional comedians or even are themselves professional comedians and. 
and the Ministry of Health and Welfare, for example, employs this companion animal, a very cute dog called Zongchai, uh, and with very cute memes like when you're indoor, uh, keep three uh, Shiba Inus away, when you're outdoor, keep two, uh, or a very cute dog putting food to their own mouth, saying, wear a mask to protect your own face against your own unwashed hand, uh, and things like that. So using those cute memes, and uh, when people feel uh, very relaxed uh, seeing this, uh, it actually gets more viral. This idea of fun and happiness and sharing actually reaches more people than the disinformation about uh, mask containing 5G antenna or, or whatever, right? So anyway, so so the point here is to to build a certain lightheartedness, uh, a certain uh, easiness of making fun of ourselves, and then uh, engaging uh, with the the people because the disinformation is mostly a symptom. It's mostly not a root cause of a lack of trust. If you have a good friend that you just chat every day and uh, just you know have dinner or lunch every every week or so, uh, and you can hear them uh, talking uh, every 2 p.m. Uh, on your, your concord or whatever, then if you hear something bad, a rumor or gossip about that friend, you just check with them, right, the next time you meet. But if that uh, friend never replied to your email, only uh, talk uh, in like a very bureaucratic language and only respond to your uh, call every, you know, once every four months, <laughs> then of course you're inclined to understand um, that uh, friend in a way that's maybe far removed from the truth and there's ripe fertile ground for disinformation to grow so the closer that we are to the citizens the the more trust we put into the citizens the more trust we get back and so maybe sort of switching gears a little bit uh, i know you're a prolific reader when you were five years old you were reading chinese classics and all that already mm -hmm. um, so so what 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 are the recent books you've read you know what what and any books you would recommend to us uh -huh. to read Sure, sure. Uh, yeah, uh, what what I read nowadays is mostly papers. <laughs> I have moved beyond books now, uh, but I, I do read uh, novels uh, for fun. Uh, recently, I've been reading uh, The Lady Butterfly of Formosa uh, or Kui Lei Hua. Uh, it's one of the TV series uh, in the public TV in Taiwan that talks about the Sikalu nation um, like many, many years ago, which signed a peace treaty with U.S. Marines and so on. So it is a is a whole new light on Taiwanese history. And if you're interested in that story, you can either read Dr. Chen Yaochang's uh, novel. I think it's translated to Japanese. The English version will be out soonish, I believe. I'm not sure. But uh, or you can you can watch uh, for free the public television uh, for international viewers. That's on TaiwanPlus.com. Uh, I think in a week or so, at, at the end of this month, will just premiere on TaiwanPlus.com. I see. I see. Yeah. Audrey, maybe another question that's not on this list, but you know what, what we've noticed with the pandemic uh, uh, taking on such a prolonged, you know, taking on like it's almost like 20 months right now since the first outbreak. Uh, the incidents uh, or how this has impacted general mental wellness and mental health of, of, of the general population seems to kind of, uh, it seems to be showing up in, in many ways. I mean, um, how do you think, you know, as a society, we can actually address it and, and, and help to kind of, uh, you know, make things better or at least prevent it from getting worse? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, I I do believe that this global neighborhood, right? I I wake up nowadays uh, to a Canadian and American counterparts, and during the day, of course, I have a chat with you folks now. But uh, later in the evening, I would talk with people uh, in Europe or in Africa. Uh, but always uh, around literally the same topics, right? Pandemic prevention, vaccination, uh, things like that. So uh, I, I do think that engaging the global neighborhood really makes a lot of sense. It First, it relieves our, our subjective burden, like we have to figure out all solutions. No, everyone is encountering pretty much the same thing. And also uh, it made our, our personal sufferings uh, seems uh, worth it, like like heroic even in a way, because you get to contribute your, your practices uh, to other corners of the earth uh, who may be 
be you know just one week or one month away from meeting the same challenge uh, as you're meeting now. So so I, I do believe that engaging in online communities uh, with kind of shared suffering and figure out some best practice and better practice together, it could be as easy as you know translating a meme picture uh, or sharing part of the the Taiwan model or any other model of pandemic prevention. But then you're making a social impact far beyond your own time zones. We're all time zone travelers now, it's not time travelers. Right, right. Audrey, I mean, you, you start off as, you know, Taiwan's youngest digital minister, first minister without portfolio when you, you joined the cabinet in 2016. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. And you have a long, illustrious, you know, career path ahead of you. But let's say, you know, I don't know, 50 years from now, when you look back, you know, what, what is the legacy you'd like to leave behind as Audrey Tang? Yeah? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would like to say that uh, I would uh, be really happy if I'm remembered as a good enough ancestor. Uh, not not a perfect one, mind you, because a perfect ancestor actually takes liberty and freedom away from the descendants by designing a perfect system. Uh, if we design something that's just good enough, right, like the Internet itself, that's good enough. It leaves a lot of rooms for the new generations uh, to innovate. And so, yeah, so, some people say that we, we need to take Take care of planet Earth, climate action, and things like that, because that's all all we have. And some other people say, no. In 50 years, we'll have other planets. That the Earth is just a cradle. We can't stay in cradle uh, forever. But I would like to say, if we can't learn to be good enough ancestors on even this cradle, uh, we can't govern other planets either. Right. So let's start small. Let's start with us. Right. And Audrey, you, you mentioned earlier on about your eight hours of sleep, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yep. What else do you what else do you do to unwind and decompress then? Yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh well, nine hours of sleep. So <laughs> 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 in, in addition to putting more hours uh, to sleep and observing the Pomodoro method, uh, one thing that I do a lot is to hug the trolls. Uh, trolls are people who are on internet that makes personal attacks or some other, uh, you know, social messages that are frankly speaking antisocial, right? Uh, but when people uh, say something mean or something targeting me uh, on social media and so on, uh, I, I thank them. Uh, I see them as contributors to a, a corpus like, oh, uh, language can be used in such a way. I, I learned something new. And then I, I respond only to the part of their uttering that could be construed as constructive. So if they uh, make 100 words attacking me personally, but five words when read in the right light may be construed as something quite constructive, uh, then I just focus my reply on that. So first, of course, is pedagogical, right? It shows people that it only pays to uh, construct some new ideas about policy, not just complaining about policy, but also it's, it's just plain fun, right? It's it's very, uh, very humorous way uh, to associate to those words. So the next time I see these words, I, I would just like literally LLL laugh out loud. And that takes out the, the tension a lot in my daily job as well. I see, I see. Thank you, Audrey. And, and you know, just I'm conscious of time. You have about three more mm -hmm. minutes. Yep. Um, if you know, I mean, I mean, you're such a brilliant mind, you know, and you know, you, 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 I mean, you, you have this very, very almost like kind of a constructive, collective, you know, refreshing view about how to tackle problems, you know, and to do it with people, not for people. Mm -hmm. um, and so what, what advice would you have, you know, for, let's say for, for DBS, you know, how, how can we become a best bank for a better world? Because that's, that's our vision here. So, so if mm -hmm. you, if you are our CEO and all that, what, what would some, what, 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 what should we do to become best bank for a better world? Okay, that sounds like a three hour seminar. <laughs> Yes, yes. I've got my three minutes. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> okay. uh, so, so right right so so theory of change so i, I think I'll, I'll just read my job description i wrote my job description uh five years ago when i uh, know that i'm becoming the digital minister but taiwan did not have a digital minister before so people rightly ask the minister what would you do right so uh i explain okay i'll further the sustainable goals i'll focus on goal 17 uh in particular not just 17 but 17 17 76 17 80 and, and so on and the hr department said you know minister i don't think the population, the citizen memorize SDGs. So, <laughs> right? so instead of talking SDG targets, we must talk in plain language. So I translated those SDG targets into plain language, which is my job description. I'll just read it to you now. It goes like this. <clears throat> when we see the internet of things, let's make it an internet of beings. 
When we see virtual reality, let's make it a shared reality. When we see machine learning, let's make it collaborative learning. When we see user experience, let's make it about human experience. And whenever we hear that a singularity is near, let us always remember the plurality is here. That's it. Thank you for listening. Wow, wow, wow. That's that's so amazing. Yeah. Thank you so much, uh, Audrey. Uh, just I think let's all put our hands together to thank Audrey for her time. Thank you so, so much. And uh, uh, truly, we are deeply honored and, and we feel very privileged. And uh, I want to say thank you for spending one hour with our team here. We have about 100 over of us from uh, six different markets. But uh, I think, you know, we will definitely remember what you've told us and taught us today. So thank you so much again. And take care. God bless you. Yeah, thank you. Live long and prosper. Yes, Bye. you too. Yeah, yeah. Bye. Okay, guys, thanks for calling in. We will kind of, I guess, regroup and recap what we've learned from Audrey today. But I think there was a lot to take in. And uh, I think uh, her job description was quite an amazing job description. So now maybe we should go back and think about writing our own job descriptions. But thank you, everybody. Take care.